Okay, guys, we are live streaming on YouTube right now. Uh, this is the Team House. I believe this is actually episode 50, and uh, we couldn't have a better guest for episode 50. We're really honored today to have Bob Charest. Uh, Bob uh, was a career special forces soldier. Um, you know, we're going to get into his story A to Z. Uh, just real quick, uh, I'm Jack Murphy, co-host Dave Park. I think everyone knows us. You're probably tired of hearing from us. But Bob had a really interesting career. He served uh, in Vietnam with Project Sigma. He served in Thailand up on the Laos border uh, with uh, the Thai military. He w went on a secret mission to Libya we're gonna be able to talk a little bit about. Um, but the bulk of what we're gonna be talking about today is Bob's two stints that he did in Special Forces Detachment A in Berlin. They were a clandestine Special Forces unit uh, nobody really knew about them, not even in the special forces community. They were almost completely unknown. And their mission, as Bob will uh, share in, in detail, uh, were primarily to act as saboteurs in the event that the Soviets ever invaded. If the Cold War went hot, these guys would go to ground undercover. And after the Soviets pushed over them, they would activate in the enemy's rear areas and just start wreaking havoc. Uh, and it was nearly a suicide mission, um, but that's really just the beginning of what Dead A did. Later on, they had a counterterrorism mission. Um, there's a lot to this, and uh, you know there are very few people as qualified as Bob to really unpack all of that for us. So, Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure, Jack. And the, you know, I, I, the title of this is the Team House. If anybody's been in Special Forces or wants to go in Special Forces. The team house is where the A team solved any mental, physical, operational problems. It was comprised of 12 men who confided in each other and really solved any problems they might have had. So the team house is a very good title. As for Thank my you. time, as, as for my time at Detached Blay, okay, back in 1956, the Cold War was really heating up. Uh, we had the four powers in Berlin after World War II, and the Soviets were trying to actually take control of uh, Berlin, who was controlled by the four powers, the French, British, uh, English, and the Russians. You remember the Berlin airlift? A lot of you guys don't remember that. Or folks don't remember that. But that's when Berlin Command and the uh, European Command realized we have to have something in place here to stop this, prevent this, or do whatever we can. So the 10 Special Forces, which was down in Baptist, Germany at the time, uh, they contacted them, coordinated uh, efforts, and sent four teams from Baptist to Berlin, Germany, uh, and undercover, completely undercover. And uh, they were there to analyze the situation, define what was proposed they wanted to do. And uh, they went to McNair Barracks first in uh, Berlin. And then about, a, I'd say a, a few months later, they went to Andrews Barracks, which was another concern, uh, very uh, enclosed, tightly secured. ASA was there, Army Security Agency was there. Uh, and Dede went there. And uh, that's when they started their missions. Then it was comprised of six teams these six teams were cr closely compartmentized. Each one had different missions within the city. Now, what these missions consisted of were sabotage, assassinations. Uh, we were all coat and tie, long hair. We blended in, we had to blend in with the uh, civilians. We spoke the language, whatever, you know, a lot of our guys were, uh, if anybody remembers the Lodge Act after World War II, uh, we recruited a lot of the East Bloc soldiers into the United States Army. In Berlin, Detachment A, we had, I'm going to mention a few names, mm -hmm. and you, you can, as I describe them, you can tell Hermann Adler, Gerhard Kunert, Martin Jurek, Hilmar Kulik. Now, a lot of these guys, like Hilmar Kulik, he was born in Berlin. He's a, a real Berliner. He's retired there today. 
Uh, Martin Urich was involved in one of the largest tank battles in Russia with the German army. Gerhard Kunert was also in the tank corps in the German army. Hermann Abler was in the SS in the German army. Okay, other nationals, when I got there, you know, I thought I was in a foreign army. I mean, you had guys like Karl Reich, Wolfgang Ostertag, Ernst Steuer, Jeff Reka, George Muskeluk, Stanley Olshevik. Now, do these name, names, do they sound like Southerners or somebody, you know? <laughs> you know it was a, Good Southern Baptists. <laughs> yeah. Now, and these guys played a very important role because they taught us mannerisms, customs, and things like this. I mean, uh, it, it, was, it was unreal. The missions were very complicated, sabotage, like I told you, stuff like this. I mean, we uh, were responsible for, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples, like the, uh, they had a railroad ring that surrounded East and West Berlin. Okay, now these railroads are fired by uh, coal. And so we had in our arsenal, coals, filled with C3 at the time with blasting caps. Okay, so if they shovel those into the, uh, one of the ways we sabotage things is they shovel them in the locomotive, bang, that goes the locomotive. Uh, it, was, uh, it was unbelievable the missions and the things that we had to do. And if any of you folks got any particular questions, I mean, it was like a, we were like a poor man's James Bond, only it was real, it was not, artificial. You know, we communicated by dead drops, primarily meeting places, live drops, things like this. I mean, it was uh, plain clothes all over the city. You were trying to get as close to the targets that you were responsible for. Like I said, six teams. Each team had a different mission, several missions, as a matter of fact. Uh, and they were real and we participated in them 24 seven. We we're always on standby and stuff like this. And uh, so Berlin detachment A was, I did not know I had served in special forces. I volunteered in 1961, completed my course uh, in 62, was assigned the first SF group in Okinawa. Did my first tour uh, in Vietnam in 63 with the mountain yards. And I left there. <clears throat> Went to Bad Tulse, Germany, 10 Special Forces Group. That's when I started finding out little pieces about Berlin because that detachment A used to come down to Bad Tulse for particular exercises like flintlock and stuff like this. And we would, uh, they would use us as guerrillas because they were language qualified. They selected safe houses within the areas that we operated in because of the languages and things like this. So this basically gives you an idea of what initially you would want to know about uh, detachment A. Any particular questions, just fire on white. And how, what was, uh, you know, if the balloon ever did go up, Bob, just so, you know, the Soviets have now invaded Berlin. You guys act, activated sabotage cells. You complete your missions. Th then what, how, how do you get out of there? Okay, there was no formal escape and evasion plan. It was up to the individual himself. We were very individual. Most of our activities were, you know, it was like uh, you were on your own. That was special about detachment A. Each person there had a particular responsibility. And they, you know, like I said, there was no formal escape and evasion route. We were, first thing we would do was head to the, uh, the East Sea, and stuff like waterways outside of Berlin. We'd try to escape and evade if possible. But our chances were very slim, even though we spoke the language. Mm -hmm. If we were being interrogated uh, by the KGB or the, uh, the Stasi, German secret police and stuff like this, it wouldn't take very long to find out who we were. Right, so, right. you know, that's that what we would do. It was an individual responsibility to escape and evade. And I, I think that's, what, as you mentioned, such a unique part of what Dead A was doing that you guys developed. Your, I mean, you had an assignment, but you were developing the mission plan. And even the other teams in Dead A did not know what the, the adjacent teams in the same unit were up to. Like, it was all compartmentalized. 
Exactly. I mean, uh, you know, the upstairs in detachment A, we had three levels in detachment A. Upstairs were the operational sections, iron gated team rooms. Okay. You never communicated with each other during the day. You were all involved in your teams behind closed doors. Okay. And like you just said, it was compartmentized. Nobody from another team knew what the other team was their targets or their responsibilities. Our association with each other was extremely limited. Uh, <laughs> and it was almost like you didn't, you didn't know anybody, okay? You pass them, you're the morning formation upstairs. We could not have formations outside because uh, plain clothes, and long hair and stuff like this. So we had formations on the second floor each morning. And then once the formation was over, you went about your business. And come closing time in the evening, everybody was gone. So there was no no talking. Okay, later on, <clears throat> uh, we developed a team house. Uh, we call it the uh, uh, I guess it was a day room. Yes, the day room. It was an uh, old abandoned mess hall from the '60s. Dead A took it over, and we uh, built a little team house down there. And it was called a day room. We put a bar in, parachute canopy over it, and stuff like this. And we had Pilsner beer from uh, Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> so then we started having meetings, not meetings, but associations with each other. Very limited stuff like this. And then that further developed into something better and bigger. Then we were working with the West German secret police. And uh, they would come, and Friday afternoon was called Chicken Friday. And Chicken Friday, it was a day you cleaned up the barracks. We had German vehicles with German plates, and we'd service them and stuff like this and clean the building. And then come about 2 o'clock in the afternoon was beer time. And that lasted into Saturday morning, okay? We had the German secret police in there <laughs> and uh, stuff like this. And we uh, got a lot done. We really got a lot done downstairs in that day room, let me tell you. Bob, I want to uh, rewind. I mean, that was about an amazing introduction to Detachment A. I want to rewind a little bit, just talk about, you know, at, at the beginning, where did you come from? How did you find your way into the Army in the early 1960s? <laughs> That's a story. <laughs> yeah, I got. I had to leave Dodge at 17, <laughs> Newfields, Newfields, New Hampshire. <clears throat> and uh, I was very lucky. I had Dave Peasley. He was a recruiting sergeant in my hometown. He realized I was headed down the wrong road. So he said, would you be interested in joining the military? I said, hell yes. Well, I was 16, so he got me in the National Guard first. And then he said, uh, will your mother and father sign for you at 17? I said, sign for me. They'll give me away, you know? <laughs> so I said, I, he said, where do you want to go? I said, far away. He says, how, how about Germany? I said, that's far away. So I went to Germany, 11th Cav, uh, patrolled the East German border and stuff like this. And then my tour, after four years, I was sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. What, what year was that, Bob, that you were, that you were patrolling the border as a, as a young infantryman? Oh, that was 57, 58, 59. So not, not so long <laughs> after the conclusion of the war. I mean, it right. must have been pretty rough in Berlin in those days. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. And uh, so I came back to Fort Bragg, 1961. <clears throat> JFK came down to Fort Bragg. And uh, Colonel Yarborough put on a demonstration for uh, special forces. And JFK took a look around. He said, who the hell are these people? And he, he was astounded by the uh, demonstrations he put on. And, and the question came out about our Green Beret. He says, what's that? And he says, this is our unofficial headgear that we wear. And he uh, was so impressed that he, that was the birth of the Green Beret for special forces. So I immediately volunteered right after he came down there and was accepted. Like I said, I went to jump school and in 62, I was in uh, training group <clears throat> and with the first group from training group in Vietnam for the mountain yards. And then the bad Tulsa, bad Tulsa. I was there and, and then after three years, 
the Vietnam War had exploded. Vietnam was built up to about 500,000 people. So I knew, I said, once this tour is opened up, I'm going to have to go back to Vietnam. So I called Billy Alexander. She was in special categories at DC mm -hmm. and she was an angel. And I asked her, I says, what's my, what's my future look like? She said, well, <laughs> if you volunteer to go back to Vietnam, here's what I can do for you. She says, if you get out of Vietnam, I'll send you to language school, German. And I'll give you the choice of Bad Tolf, Germany, or Detachment A, if you complete language school. I said, I'll take it. So I went there, I went to Vietnam, B-56 Project Sigma. I had a few friends that were there from uh, Bad Tolf. And uh, they requested Sergeant Major John Brunkhart wanted me to be in B-56. He was waiting at Long Bed, Vietnam, and talking to the repo devil and said, if Bob Charest, son Bob Charest comes here, I want to know. So they contacted me once I got in country and said, it's Sergeant Major Brunkhoff and wanting to see you. And he, they want to, so they called him, he came up and got me and I spent a year down there and with B-56 Project Sigma. And uh, that was very intense. That was the, uh, you had Omega, Sigma and Delta in them days. That was a birth of control of, CC South, CC North, and CC Central controlled because Omega, Delta, and Sigma couldn't handle it. It was getting too bad, too fast. And we were being over uh, extended. So they really opened it up. And uh, I did go, I was in CC South uh, for a brief time. I opened the camp, I went there and I slept in a Connex container. Uh, and for about three weeks, and I was due to rotate. That's when I rotated and uh, went to uh, language school, completed what, language school. Uh, it, yeah, uh, Bob, you, what, what, what was Project Sigma? Can yeah, you tell us a little it, bit about yeah, that? Can you, yeah, give us a little bit about Omega, Delta, and Sigma for our, our viewers who aren't familiar with those outfits. Yeah, that was the beginning of special operations. That was the ground force of special operations. It was called Studies and Observation Groups. Very uh, insignificant name, but we ran recon, company-sized operations. Uh, my Sigma was Cambodia. Omega was Cambodia. Uh, we ran operations across the border. We weren't supposed to be there. I mean, uh, you know, it was, but we were. We that uh, was our operational areas. All along the border uh, in Third Corps uh, in Vietnam, we ran uh, recon missions, primarily recon missions. We ran hatchet teams. A recon team was six people, four in Dij, two Americans. A hatchet team was about 18 folks, uh, probably six Americans, the rest were in Dij. We dealt strictly with Cambodians, Cambodian forces, and Chinese nuns. Vietnamese were worthless. So we did not trust the Vietnamese. We never worked with the Vietnamese. Uh, we had a couple of Vietnamese special forces come to our camp at uh, Ho Nok Tau in uh, South Vietnam. It was between Long Binh and Saigon. All they did was a guy showed up, a major, with this shiny Jeep with a handshaker on the side, browning high power, nice on his hip. And the first thing he tried to do was uh, tap the Indige mess hall for funds. First thing he tried to do, well, we ran his ass off and said, okay, goodbye. But that was strictly Omega, Sigma, and Delta were the beginning of the special operations forces. Like I'm, I'm talking about CNC South, CNC North, and, and CNC Central. It's what, what became MACV SOG? MACV SOG was Sigma. Okay, we came under MACV, downtown, Op, Op 35, down, General Singlob was one of the uh, commanders of uh, SOG at that time. We operated out of, the headquarters was downtown, downtown in Saigon, Op, it was called Op 35 for Sigma, mm -hmm. okay? And, and were you with the Hatchet Force or a recon team? What, what was your part in it? I, when you're in Sigma, when you're in that outfit, you're everything. You do everything. You ran companies, you ran recon, you ran hatchet forces, everything. I uh, got my fourth Purple Heart when I was there. 
and Sigma, and I was on a hatchet team in Cambodia. We went in, we were tasked with uh, looking for underground bridges under the water. They'd plant mm-hmm. their bridges about two feet under the water so they could move tanks and stuff. They were starting to move tanks in the South Vietnam. On the Ho Chi Minh So we were tasked trail. to go in. Yes. And so we went in to find these and uh, we got in, we were really deep in there. And all of a sudden, myself and uh, Rick LaVoy, we were taking a break, drinking water. We saw, we were looking down under the terrain there, the jungle, we saw footprints, feet running all around. And we said, oh, shit, we're being surrounded. So we stopped and we got, we got back together again and said, OK, look, they're there. We got to go back out the same way we came in. You know what that means? We're going to be ambushed. So by that time, the point man was pretty exhausted. So they said, we got to have a, somebody take the point. Well, we had colonel, a colonel and a sergeant major on that hatchet team. So you know they weren't going to go on a point, right? So Bob Charest had to go on a point. <laughs> and I said, okay, guys, look, we're going to get hit. <clears throat> and I said, if I get hit, I'm going to try to break through, but I need you guys to get up there fast. Well, we did get hit. We got hit. We busted a, We busted the ambush up, but I got almost got my head blown off. I got shrapnel wounds on my face from a claymore mine. And we, we shot our way out, regrouped, set up an ambush that night. We had 175 artillery on, on call right there. We had FOs, two FOs with us on an team. So we called in 175s. I, I, I think I shot four. I got four KIAs that day. And we got out, busted out, regrouped, and called in 175s, had an ambush that night, and was uh, we moved back out the next day. Bob, Rick, Rick Lavoie sounds so familiar. I, 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 <clears throat> I'm trying to place where I may have talked to him or come across him. Old 10th group guy. Uh, he's uh, been around for a long time. He was was, was he his... with Det K in Korea? Yes, he was. That's, uh, that's, that's, exactly where I, that's where I'm familiar with him. That's, that's Rick Lavoie. That's okay. Lavoie. <laughs> yep. Bob, you had already been in Vietnam and, you know, how, as, as special forces, how was being part of Sigma different than being, you know, because people think a special force was already, like your first appointment with already a special ops. So what was, what was different about Sigma compared to like your first tour, which we would call, I guess, a vanilla special forces tour, if there was such a thing? It was a typical 12 man, the old real special forces back in the day when special forces became famous in Vietnam. We were assigned to replace an A-team that was already there at uh, the the, uh, mountain yard camp at Chio Rio. So we came in, replaced that team. They flew back to Okinawa. It was a 12 man team. We had about 200 Jirai mountain tribes which we equipped, trained, and led, and lived with them. You lived very primitively, let me tell you. We had one kerosene refrigerator, and that was mainly for beer. We had a Chinese cook. He was Chinese and half Vietnamese. And this was, we had, there was a lot of uh, leftovers from the Indochina War uh, within the Jirai tribes there. So uh, half the team had to speak French, and the other half spoke Vietnamese. Uh, we went to language school for both that on Okinawa before we were deployed. We did a very extensive uh, area study on the area that we're going into, uh, everything, customs, you name it. And you went there and you lived with them. And one thing about the mountain tribes, the once you respected their customs, showed your leadership they would do anything for you you could you could you could trust them day and night i lived in a little combo shack with a grass roof and you could hear the rats up there at night sound like they had combat boots on okay <laughs> and then you would hear this little pump 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 and you you what the hell was that you'd go outside your little bunker there there's this little mountain yard he had a little couple of batteries that I threw away, he had a little light, and he had a crossbow, and he was shooting these 
rats for <laughs> dinner, okay? And it, it, that was a very, that was my first real mission with special forces. And I loved it. That six month tour, that tour with those mountain tribes was un unbelievable. I mean, uh, it was, so that was a difference. That was the beginning of the Vietnam War. There was something like 19,000 total Americans in Vietnam at that time. And John F. Kennedy was talking about reducing that number at the time. Then he got shot in October and uh, killed. And I got shot in October in my left leg and uh, things changed. That, that, then it, Vietnam exploded and uh, the rest is history. Very uh, similar in that regards to um, when we talked to John Mullins a couple episodes back and he was there pretty early on in the war and went back three more times. And I, I don't know what your thoughts are, Bob, but do you think it was a mistake for the United States military to put all those conventional troops into Vietnam? Absolutely. Yeah. It was definitely a mistake. We didn't belong there. No way. What did we accomplish? Then we ran out of there with a tail between our legs. You know. And so it was totally different then between your first deployment and your second one going back there with Project Sigma. Definitely. I'm complete. I mean, the, that was an eye opener. Project Sigma was a real eye opener. Uh, we were very self sustained in our operations. Uh, we worked closely with the CIA on uh, target selections and stuff like this. And we weren't controlled by the conventional army. We, army, we acted independently. They always wanted operational, okay, what's your operational plan for this upcoming uh, attack on this, this, and this? Well, we'd give them a false one and would take our own because theirs were almost, would be compromised. Mm -hmm. The conventional army was not ready for special forces. They did not have intelligence. I remember going down to Saigon and uh, they had a big brand new intelligence uh, complex built. I walked in there with my little M16 on my shoulder, dusty and dirty, coming down from them, uh, the camp going into Saigon and stuff like that. And they'd say, I'd, I'd be looking for intelligence for upcoming operations. And they, all they told me was, we rely on you people for our intelligence. I'm going, oh, really? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I said, this big complex, these guys did not go out on the ground. They did, not, they did not know what was really going on. It was unbelievable. And that highway, Highway 1, which went by our camp between Long Bin and Saigon, was full of uh, you know, whorehouses. On the, we call them car washes, okay, on the side of the road. And that's where all these conventional guys would go. They'd go down there and they just, you know, I never saw them really engaged. I went on, uh, I, 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 Ninth Infantry Division, one time I, up by NK, I think it was, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. I mean, it was it was unreal. I just wondered, so what the hell are all these guys doing over here? So, that sounds very familiar, Bob. I don't know what you think, Dave. Sound, sounds <laughs> a bit familiar. Yep, it does. Uh, and these operations, when you guys were going across the fence into Cambodia, what would have happened or what did happen when you know somebody lost their life because it was completely deniable uh yes, sort of like detachment a in that sense right it was but these our missions like i told you just a while ago our op orders were our own right. we had a helicopter dedicated helicopter unit assigned to us it was not a special forces helicopter unit it was just a dedicated um helicopter unit that was dedicated to sigma so we were very fortunate that we could coordinate our operations. Now you had, okay, we taken a, for an example, recon team. A recon team would go in with two slicks. Two slicks mean two H, uh, the, what do you call them? Jack, uh, the, uh, the Hueys. Hueys. The, the Hueys. Ones, yeah. yeah, the Hueys. And they'd go in, you had two slicks. We'd have three guys on each slick going in and two gunships behind us. So we would fly around. We knew where we were going to be inserted, but we would fly around and make uh, false landings mm -hmm. so that you know, the Viet Cong was out there looking for us all the time. So we'd do two or three false landings and then finally put us put the team on the ground. Team on the ground had a sign recon mission. 
we were never designed to be engaged in a, a combat, okay? And so we would just observe uh, movement, troop movements and stuff like this. And every now and then it didn't go quite that good. And we got compromised a few times because they were waiting for us. Matter of fact, one of the guys on my uh, team, we were we got inserted, we put, started putting out the claymores. He was putting out the claymore. And next thing I know, he got stitched with an AK-47 right up the middle. I carried him out, put him on a chopper, and we got out of that guy, that, that place that day. And uh, he was another German displaced person, lawjack guy that joined the army. And uh, that's what, you know, you did that. And it was, uh, it was hard, but it was part of your job. And Larry Thorne was down there too. Uh, we've talked yes, about him yeah. a little bit before. Oh yeah, Larry Thorne was pretty, uh, he was quite a guy. He was, uh, I think, a Finn, Finland. He had a yeah. medal, medal of honor, whatever it's called from the Finnish army. Yeah, he was quite a guy. So from, from Vietnam and the, uh, I believe you said it was a Sergeant Major, kind of like groomed you or recruited you into Dead A, right? Even though you didn't totally know what it was. No, I didn't. I had, you know, like everybody, you hear rumors mm -hmm. within the SF community or oh, Detachment A, the Berlin Bandits, they were called, stuff like this. And uh, they'd come down to Bad Tulsa. I remember when I was in Bad Tulsa, and you'd see them, they'd come down for a jump, parachute jump once a month for proficiency pay and stuff like this. And there they are running around with this long hair, stuff like this. They didn't really engage with us and stuff like this. They did their jump, got on a uh, truck and went back up to Munich, got on the plane, went back into Berlin. And uh, that's the last you saw of them, okay? And uh, a couple of times, like on Flintlock, like I told you, they would be attached to us to help in safe houses and stuff like this, transportation, uh, working with the Bundesgrenzschutz, BGS-9. They were, they were our aggressors all the time, the BGS-9 over there when we were in uh, Bad Tools. Also in Berlin, we trained with the BGS-9 anti-terrorist unit. They were very proficient. They used live ammunition, high-speed Mercedes. You pull that back seat down, it hit every weapon you wanted for any situation you wanted. Shotgun, automatic, pistol, grenade launcher, right in the back of that. You took that thing down, and there it was. And these were high-speed Mercedes. They, and they, you, know, you were all trained in evasive driving techniques and stuff like this. It was, they were so professional, it was unbelievable. The Bundeskrieg troops, BGS nine, it was called. So, what was it like then? That that first rotation into Dead A, and and I, I suppose it was the late nineteen sixties. Yeah, I got there. Yeah, after language school, I got there in nineteen sixty nine. We were still in uh, coat and tie mode. Uh, your underwear were German. Everything was German. Uh, you got there. They gave you an allowance. So many Deutschmarks. You went down to KDV which was equivalent to Sears. You picked out your jacket, ties, pants, underwear, socks, stuff like this. Uh, and you operated a lot in the city every day. You went down, you did reconning, PMPs, stuff like this among yourselves. Uh, you tailed yourselves and you tailed suspected uh, KGB or whatever. All the time you worked in the city. Scuba was becoming very big. Now I was one of the only scuba qualified instructors at the time. And at that time, and I, so I was assigned to the scuba team and we had uh, Drager equipment, strictly German, double stage tanks, uh, wetsuits. We had a one man compressor, decompression chamber. All our equipment was Drager, which is, you know, the high class German scuba equipment. And scuba was very heavy because of the, uh, the wall that went up denied us access to a lot of our targets. So we had to find access routes to get to our assigned targets. So we used the Wan Sea. They had a lot of sea, you know, which was a big lake in uh, West and East Berlin. So we used J boats, sailboats to train We'd go out there in the Wanzi and just hit that J boat, go all around the Wanzi and look for selected crossover sites. And with the scuba equipment, we could also access East Berlin by the canals. 
there were a lot of canals in, in, in eastern and west Berlin. And you could use those to infiltrate if you had to. Now, were these rebreathers at that time? No, the not at that time. The rebreathers okay. came in uh, uh, the 70s. Okay. And we got those before the, even before the SEALs had them. We had the best German rebreathers, and we used to train up in Eckenfurt, Germany, with the German scubas people. They, they trained us on that rebreather, super secret job, you know, and what's famous about the rebreather is, you know, you don't have bubbles. Right. Like the regular scuba does, yeah. you know, that's, that, that's an ID. I mean, you're under there in a canal in the middle of Berlin at night, and some of the people, Germans, like to walk. Yeah. They look over there and see bubbles. They're going, what the hell is going so, on yeah. there? So, or, Bob, did, uh, did any of you guys make any uh, clandestine trips up and uh, across the border uh, scouting out these canals? Yes, there was one guy that did that, Bill Coyne. He, uh, he actually did that. Really? Now, if anybody else did, I didn't know because it was a signed mission of some other team. Okay, but I know I do know that Bill Queen did make a recon in. And, and what was that the plan for your team that you would do a subsurface infiltration if if we had to if called upon if if it came to yeah if it came to that yes. Now, how much? Uh, so you you get assigned to debt A. What happens when you show up, you get off the plane in, in Berlin, you don't, at that point, you don't really know what it is, right? Right. So what happens then? Like walk us through sort of what your impressions were, how, how you were brought on and, and what you were told. Okay, when I was in language school and I got my orders for Berlin, I immediately got a letter from a uh, sponsor and told me exactly, he said, stop, let your hair go a little longer. Do not report to Berlin in uniform. You will be flown by civilian aircraft into Tempelhof. You will not talk to anybody. A person will meet you at Tempelhof and will escort you to Detachment A. My guy was Terry Swafford. Uh, he was, matter of fact, he spent a lot of time in Berlin and he was one of the last Command Sergeant Majors in uh, Berlin when, the, when it closed in 1984. Terry Swafford was my sponsor. And uh, sure enough, I flew, started let my hair grow out. You had to be in civilian clothes. You could not wear a uniform. You got the Tempelhof Air Base and you stood there. And of course, they knew exactly who you were. And, you know, Terry, you know, he, we all look, you know, he's a, He's an American, I know it. So they walk up, got you, they come on, follow me. And you were taken to dead A in a civilian vehicle and you were briefed and assigned to a team. And then you started learning city techniques. Like I said, the dead drops, PMPs, uh, live drops, uh, surveillance. Uh, you were experts at the transit system, the U-Bahn in uh, Berlin. You knew that exactly. Uh, you knew how to exit and enter a uh, one of the cars on the tracks there. Exactly. You could count it by seconds. If somebody was tailing you, you would stand there just like you're hooking up on your own, like you're riding that car. And next thing you know, it, it would stop at a station and you had two seconds, maybe one. You get out, that door would close. Who was following you? There he went down down the tracks. Okay. So it was it was pretty intense. City training was very important. The detachment A had a city training team that we cross-trained people from 10th group in Bad Tulse. Uh, then when they moved to uh, one, they moved to uh, Port Devils, Massachusetts, they would send people over teams. We'd cross-train them in city training. SEAL team two down in Crete. We cross-trained them in city training. Uh, it was about a two-week course. We showed them exactly what we did in the city, how we did it, and they became proficient and stuff like this. It was one of the highlights. Yeah. And when you received that initial briefing, uh, did you feel like it was a suicide mission that they had given you? I mean, what, no, what were your no. initial impressions? No, it, it did not at that time, no. You, you were pretty impressed with the... Uh, 
you got an overall briefing. It was just a familiarization briefing on detachment A's operations. And then you were assigned to a team. When you were assigned to that team, that's when you were briefed on your actual missions, mm -hmm. plural. You had several missions, plural. Mm -hmm. You were briefed on those. You had uh, mock-ups. Uh, you did what recon you could do, you did. Uh, we could go across with these G28 patrols. They were called uh, MP driver, uh, Berlin Brigade sedan. They were designated routes that they were designed, designated. Soviets had they also had designated routes they could follow in our sectors. Uh, like you could go to Kalmox plots and do shopping and stuff like this. And there was certain restaurants you could go to over there. And it was even a secret little, uh, what they call it, the wives used to go to this place where they could buy crystal, real crystal in a back room. Okay, this, this operator had a, a nice crystal section. She'd sell you very cheap. I mean, the, the, the dollar was, I mean, unbelievable with the East German mark mm -hmm. comparison. I mean, you go over there for about a dollar, you could have wine, schnitzel, whatever you wanted, you know, it was, it was, it was really something, but you could, you could go over there. You took a look around, you understood, you mingled with the people. And, uh, that was as close as you could come to your target. Now, were you or anybody in debt a, were, were you guys involved with developing assets or was it mostly just the physical reconnaissance and sort of uh, target analysis type stuff? It was mainly that, target analysis, okay? We didn't have a chance to mingle with the locals because that would blow our cover, okay? You did not want to mingle with any locals. Now, I did, okay, I'll give you an example. I was uh, intimate with this German school teacher and I lived with her. Now, her sister was associated with the bottom Einhoff gang. Wow. So I used this as an intelligence asset. Okay, you couldn't get no closer than that. Yeah, you were a you were a hardcore communist, and uh, and the school teacher I was going with, uh, I just played along with the game, and I went to a couple of meetings where they <laughs> had their little functions downtown oh, in my. Berlin, and uh, you know, it was pretty interesting. Well, what was what was that like? So you were actually at a meeting for the Red Army faction in Berlin. And during the Cold War, I mean, you talk about, I mean, you were in the belly of the beast right there. I mean, sure. I mean, for Christ's sake, Bob, I mean, you, you would fought commies in Vietnam. I mean, if they found out who you were, I, I can only imagine. Yep, that's true. I, I, I mean, I played along. I, I, I felt uneasy, but I knew it was an asset and I reported it. OK, it was uh, it was recorded for the appropriate people to investigate it. They did. And uh what happened after that, I don't know if it was effective, but we did clean up the bottom Meinhof gang. We, they, we were, they were under surveillance constantly, not only by my team, but his other teams. It was, they were a known threat to everybody, especially Americans in Berlin. They used to blow up uh, cars at the NCO club or the officers club and stuff like this. I mean, they were a real threat. The bottom Einhoff gang was a threat. Yeah, they were hardcore. Well, I mean, describe yeah. this scene to, to us. Was, like, I imagine you're like in a basement of a warehouse somewhere. I, I mean, and they have like Soviet flags up on the walls. I mean, <laughs> but what, what was that really like? But of course, there were flags up on the wall. Uh, the other guy, Che Guevara. Yeah, he, he was on the wall. And I, uh, I, I got it, man. I drank my beer, had a good time. And when I was ready to go, I said, let's go. Uh, and we took off and went. And I, next day, I was standing in front of whoever and said, hey, I had a pretty interesting night last night. You might want to record this or take some action on this stuff. They did. And it was effective. It's wild. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, too, I want to ask you about, Bob, is, you know, you were, a, you were a Green Beret. You were a commando. You had led indigenous soldiers in combat in Cambodia and Vietnam. I mean, it's hardcore stuff. Now you're in dead A, you're still a commando, but you're also so much more than that. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you developed your, you know, your alias, your legend about to, to kind of give you, you know, cover while you were there in Berlin. They did. We had dual 
We had dual passports for one thing. We had several ID cards. We had GS cards, uh, government civilian cards, uh, GS-11, GS-9s, uh, uh, dual passports. I was dark, so my was a Turkish. Okay, there was a million Turk guest arbeiters in Germany, guest workers, as you call them. Uh, so you could go downtown and blend in with anybody downtown. We did that a lot. We did that when we were in the city itself on city training. Uh, it was important to have a cover. And it was, like I said, dual passports. We had a red passport also for uh, embassy purposes, stuff like the diplomatic passport, I guess they call it, yes. Uh, everybody had a dual identity in, in the Desperate based on their ethnic background, like guys we had, well, the Germans are what we had, we had Poles, we had Czechs, we had Russians, uh, Greeks, uh, you name it. We had every nationality there. So it was not hard to have a dual uh, cover, as we called it. And uh, was there anything you had to do to build up, um, I don't know, like, like integrate with the community to, you know, help um, backstop that cover? Well, let me see. I'm just thinking of, uh, I think it was Colonel Wild who told me he uh, coached a German basketball team. Right. Yeah, that was Bill Wild. Yeah. yeah Bill yeah. Wild. Yep, yep. Yeah, you had that. I did not explore that. I was, with, like I said, I was with this German school teacher. She had a young son. I helped him with football, soccer. Okay. He, he, he was a big soccer fan. So he was my key to my cover to go to soccer games and stuff like this. And I lived with her at a German place downtown. Uh, so I was constantly in the city at all times, I guess you would say, except I had a BEQ room at Andrews Barracks, uh, but I very seldom stayed there. I was almost downtown living with this uh, school teacher. And that improved my proficiency in language 100%. Like I said, it got me in there with her sister, who I know I knew she was a hardcore communist. And uh, several times I went with different functions with her, like a wedding and stuff like this. So I got to in the mingle with uh, the civilian population quite a bit. And how did they know you? Did they know you as a soldier, as a businessman, as a government contractor? Like, nope, they, did, huh? nope they, ne they never, nobody ever questioned me. My, my proficiency in German was, uh, one of the Germans told me, you have a, uh, you do not have an accent at all. I was so proficient in my language that you could mingle right in. And I looked different because I was dark, okay? I had black hair and very dark. And I, they knew I was not German, but they never questioned me about what, what was I, an American? What was I, a military man, a businessman, like you just asked me? No, nope, they never, they never got nosy. Never question me. Never. Let's, uh, while, while we're on this subject, let's uh, show some uh, Bob Charest pictures here. I, think <laughs> I got some. Oh, there yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, back in my younger days. Oh, yeah. That was a, that was a meeting with some Germans also. Okay. This guy on the extreme left, I think it was Larry Niederhaus. The other two guys, I don't know. Uh, but that was a German meeting. I remember that. We were doing something for the Germans. I don't know what that was. And uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, oh, I got you, uh, Bob, with his uh, mutton chops. I think you guys definitely need to see that one. There you oh. go. Well, that's a relaxed grooming, okay? Uh, now you take that. That's normal. Uh, if you were downtown on a one of our assigned uh, deployment missions where we tested ourselves as guerrillas, you would have a full beard in addition to that long hair. You would have a full beard. And uh, you went around town doing your things, uh, scoping out different places, stuff like this that you were assigned to. But that was the normal relaxed grooming standards. 
And uh, I'd like to show this. This is this is not uh, Bob. This is uh, Doc Farr, Warner Farr. <laughs> yeah, you um, the, I know that picture. Yeah, you, yeah, you know this one. This is this is a good picture though. Uh, here we go. And this is his subway pass here. Yep, it's a subway pass that you got because we, like I said, we use the U-Bahn extensively. That was our to-go place wherever you wanted to go in the cities. Okay, you went. And the reason why was there was no attention to you. You were just a regular person riding on the U-Bahn in town, going from one place to another. So we did, you didn't attract any attention. If you went by POV or any other means, okay, you attracted attention. Mm -hmm. But this is how we got around the city. You had the U-Bahn, which was West Germany, and you had the S-Bahn, which was East Germany. Okay, these are two different rail lines, two different travel, uh, two different situations of travel. Okay, we would probe that sometimes. I did get to, to get on the S-Bahn and it was an underground transportation system in Berlin, underground, I mean, really underneath. And this was another time I went down there to buy some uh, Greek cognac. I was with a Greek girl and we went down there and I'm down there. It's a rough assignment, I... Bob. This is a rough assignment you got here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I'm, there's these uh, Stasi walk around with their, you know, weapons and stuff like this. I'm walking by with my cognac. I forget what the Greek name is for cognac. But anyway, that's how you, that's how you did it, though. You, that, you had to mingle. You really did. And uh, I got a thumbnail here also. We, we, we spoke about uh, Jeff Raker. I'll throw uh, his picture up there real quick. It's a little yep. small. Let's see if that's I can the remember. man. That's the old Jeff. Yep. Good friend of mine. Jeff Definitely. was, he was, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, he was not lodged, but he was a German immigrant. Yeah, he was born in Sudetenland in mm -hmm. Germany. And he got, uh, they were, I guess they had allocations in his day for folks that wanted to become a soldier. Uh, they had a something like a lotto to pick from. Uh, and he got lucky and picked it and got selected and the rest is history. Bob, with with the Lodge Act, you know, we talk about that and, you know, and we've talked about the importance of, especially in early special forces about, you know, sort of immigrants bringing, you know, their, their cultural and, and language abilities to bear. And I, I think in the article Jack wrote that at one point in time, like, Debt A was was more Lodge Act soldiers than, uh, than uh, natural born American soldiers. It was, definitely it was, and that was on purpose because of the mission. And that's why they selected these folks at Bad Tools, Germany to go to Berlin. And uh, initially it was, like you said, it was almost all, I mean, like I, the names I mentioned was just a, a, a very few. I mean, there was a, a lot more people there. I mean, it was strictly German, Russian, Poles, uh, real Berliners, they were from Berlin, born in Berlin, Karl Reich, he was born in Berlin. Uh, and it was a, I mean, for the mission, they were quite an asset. Let me tell you what, they were really, I mean, they did a lot of things that were, we could not as Americans do ourselves. Now, being, being that some of, you know, there was overlap with the World War II generation and whatnot, were there hard feelings ever? Were there were, were there like cultural impasses that couldn't be breached? There were some hard feelings, yes, because the Europeans had their own ways. All right, sometimes they were very like a click, and uh, you couldn't kind of break into that click. Okay, they were pretty self-centered folks. Uh, they stuck together very well, and they uh, didn't didn't really associate with us too much at all. Now, my one of my team sergeants was Hilmar Kulik. Okay, he was, uh, like I said, he was, he's a real Berliner, he's there today. And he was my team sergeant, he was real good. He was a different kind of European and he assimilated real well with uh, us guys. I, I, like I say us guys, but uh, he was uh, quite an asset, but most of them were on their own. They stuck together quite a bit. 
they, which, well, which one was it, Bob? There, there was it Cooner who, uh, when the sergeant major was asking if guys could want to go to the D Day yes. reunion, That's and Cooner says, "Yeah, I want to go. I was with Sixth Panzer." And they're yeah. like, "No, no, no." <laughs> yeah, 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 hard Cooner. Yeah, he, uh, he was another. Now most of these guys, these Europeans who were in Dead A, you hardly ever saw them in the United States. They stayed there. Yeah, until Vietnam started exploding. And all of a sudden, they were pried out of dead A to go to Vietnam. They wasn't. They did not. That was unreal for a lot of them because they were so self-centered. Dead A kept them there because it was important. Yeah. They, 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 they were uh, a real asset to that NATO mission that we had uh, early on, the Cold War. The Cold War was the biggest thing going up until Vietnam. So they had to be there in Berlin, and they stayed there in Berlin. Then all of a sudden, Vietnam exploded in the 60s. And next you know, there they were. Their name was, their name came up, you're going to Vietnam. And they did not like that at all. Boy, let That's, me tell you, it was. Uh, that, is such a, a, that is such an unknown story, Bob, that people don't get. Like what you were saying, that Lajak soldier on your team getting shot up out yep. on target in Cambodia. People just don't know about that. Nope, nope, they don't. Uh, this little guy, I can't think of his name right now, but he was, a, he was in the French Foreign Legion. He was uh, in the, I think it was a Polish army. And then he came to Honok Tau and, and Sigma. And I don't know why anyone ever put him on recon because he was getting kind of old anyways. And he didn't belong in recon. And that was quite a sad story right there, but he was a, quite a guy. The, uh, the other interesting thing, too, is, yeah, at uh, on one hand, you have a unit that's kind of packed full of reformed Nazis, but the commander of Dead A at one point, uh, Sid Shatnow, was a Holocaust survivor. He was. He was a Jewish Holocaust survivor, and he later became, he was a major then in the 70s, early 70s, and then later on, he became the Berlin commander at a one-star, and... Uh, then later went on to retire as a two-star general. I was, I, we got pretty close. Matter of fact, uh, I did a couple of missions for him when he was Berlin Brigade Commander. And when I left in 72 to go to Thailand, I completed my tour and I had an assignment to Fort Bragg. I got back to New Hampshire. I was at my folks' home and stuff like this. Phone call rang and I was told, you want to come back to Berlin? I said, God damn right. I'd already been down to Fort Bragg to pick up my whole baggage and stuff and talk to several guys on where I could find a BEQ room and stuff like this. So Sid Shack now said, don't sign in, get on an airplane, come right back to Berlin. That's awesome. Said, yes, sir. So I got on a plane, went back to Berlin, and he extended me, and I, I stayed for another five years in Berlin. Well, for and then we kept, go ahead. I was just going to say, before we get into all that, I'd like to hear about Thailand, um, because like some of my friends, uh, Jim Morris in particular, was someone who told me like Thailand was like the the hidden gem of, of like the whole Vietnam conflict. Like that was the mission you wanted to get. It was. Thailand was, I was an A company. A company worked for the CIA. Okay. Uh, Nampong was a headquarters for the CIA. Bull Swanson was the CIA station chief there. He was also an ex sergeant major from the 10th Special Forces of Bad Tulsa. He, he was in the same building complex I was. As a matter of fact, we used to fight over the lawnmower for, you had to go out and police the area and stuff like this. Anyway, next thing I know, there I am with Bull Swanson, CIA. A company worked strictly for the CIA, and we had a lot of missions with the CIA. Once a month, they'd fly in with a Porter aircraft, uh, give us our assignments, a little envelope with some money to go to Bangkok with for a you know, weekend. And we were there designed to train the Mayo tribes in Laos. Okay, here's what happened. The CIA would uh, send us a message. There's gonna be so many Blackhawks coming in tonight. And we got a hundred Mayo tribes. At that time, the Thailand was winding down, the whole Southeast Asia was winding down, but because Kissinger was over there for the ceasefire and they were pulling combat troops out. So we were trying to grab real estate. So we were pulling in the Mayo tribes, 
rearming them with the latest M16s, uh, M60s, they had A6s and uh, M1s and M2 carbines. So we would give them the latest weaponry, ammunition, retrain them, put them back on the aircraft, back into Laos to grab as much real estate as we could with the Mayo tribes. Okay. And then. The path uh, at Lao? Yep. Yep. Bull Swanson used to be the case officer in Sabelaket in, in uh, Laos. Then he was pulled back into Nampong in Thailand. So that's where we ended up. Uh, we ended up, we we're in Nampong Dam, way up north in Thailand, way up by Nakhon Phanom Air Base, where B 52s used to fly out of. And during Vietnam, we used to send recon teams out of Nakhon Phanom Air Base up there. So that all closed down, and we went back to Nampong to the CIA camp in A Company. And I was reassigned back to B Company as a team sergeant. Uh, and we were winding down. I had about two months and I was gone back to so, uh, Berlin. So Major Shatnow uh, hooked you up and, and just told you, get on a plane, get back That's to right. Berlin. That's what he did. <laughs> Phone call. <laughs> you don't sign in nowhere. Just get on a plane, come back to Berlin. I said, I'm on the way. That's yeah. What was it like then? Your um, was there any difference between your first rotation at Dead A and your second when arriving there after? Oh Thailand? yeah, uh, complete, completely. The mission changed uh, at that time when I returned. There were already a lot of uh, terrorist activities going on in Europe, like like I mentioned, the uh, Red Brigade, by the Meinhof gang, hijacking of aircraft. Now, uh, one thing you got to know about at that time in Berlin. The only aircraft that were allowed in Berlin were British Airways, Pan American, or the French aircraft. The only entranceway for us were the duty train from Helmstead to Berlin, and the Autobahn was the only in and out access. Now, the Russians controlled the rail line, uh, the Autobahn, and stuff like this. So what was happening was when I returned, they were renegotiating the access routes to Berlin, the four powers. Okay, so they were going to introduce regular aircraft authorization to access Tegel Airport. Tegel was replacing Tempelhof. Tegel Airport was going to be an international airport. Now, this is where Dead A came in. We were trying to avoid hijackings, which was rampant. So any American flag carrier like Pan Am, we were trained on a 707 at Tempelhof Airport, Airport and abandoned. It was an abandoned uh, 707. How to access that thing to prevent terrorists from hijacking it. Matter of fact, some of the pilots said they never heard of some of the stuff that we could do to get into that aircraft and attack these hijackers. We worked, we had Access to Pan Am, we had Pan Am uniforms, maintenance workers, staff, everything. And we would work at, at when that became available in Temple at uh, Tegel, there we were in full Pan Am uniforms to avoid uh, any uh, hijacking of American aircraft. That became the, the main mission was anti terrorist then. We were the Delta Force of uh, Berlin. Before we Delta had, Force existed. Yes. We had uh, uh, everything, uh, SWAT teams, you name it. We, we were trained. We went from UW, GW to anti-terrorist. Unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare, we were now anti-terrorist. Model 70 Winchesters for our snipers. I mean, heavy stuff. We had the SWAT teams, uh, fast cars, we, you know, everything. We had C-141 available. We work with the uh, BGS-9 closely, uh, Israeli Mossad uh, closely, and the, uh, like I said, the BGS-9. So that that was it, it, that remained until Detachment A closed. That was their last mission, anti-terrorist. It was rampant in Europe, and uh, Dead A was very effective. We had, money was no object. Did this, uh, I, I think there's an interesting point that, 
the counterterrorism mission started to interfere with your unconventional warfare mission because it raises, by the nature of these kinetic activities, it raises the profile of a unit that's supposed to be secret. But it still remained the same. Our UW mission, guerrilla warfare mission, still remained the same. That was still there. Mm -hmm. Because we were, it was strictly if the Russians reared their head and tried to come across Checkpoint Charlie and stuff like this with tanks and stuff like this, we'd go to our original mission right back to it. So now you had more training requirements. Was it was it difficult to meet those training requirements that you had a couple different mission sets? Nope, because the old missions were pretty well standard. They were mm -hmm. in place. They were there. We knew where they were there. We were trained for them. We knew what we had with the access that we had. And then a new mission came on, the anti-terrorists. We transitioned into that very easily. Uh, we trained, like I said, with the BGS-9. Uh, and our own, we had our own training, which was very intense. And we, uh, like I said, money was no problem. Uh, the uh, uh, equipment was no problem. And we assimilated very fast. And it was, it was quite a change. It was very, you know, as you can see there, we have our MPK submachine guns, which was our weapon of choice. We had the P-38 pistols that we dug up from the caches mm -hmm. that were left there. Uh, I didn't talk to you about that, but one of my missions was, our mission, I should say, was these uh, cache sites that were planted by the CIA after World War II. They were planted all over Berlin in case of an uprising. So we had to go out and dig up a couple of those to see the serviceability of them, of what were, you know, like the weapons, were, how, how was that, ammunition, radios, medical supplies, that were in these caches. So we'd go out there with a GP medium tent in uniform, but a grow all forest, put up a big GP medium tent and dig up these caches. The CIA would provide us with the coordinates and we'd dig them up, take them to uh, the 40th Armor in Berlin to the, one of their bunkers and lay them out. And the CIA would come in and check the serviceability. And a lot of the medical equipment had expired and stuff like this, dried up and stuff like this. Radios had to be replaced with newer radios, uh, things like this. Weapons uh, would be replaced as needed and stuff like that. But it was a uh, that was another interesting mission we had in detachment. Ag. And not you couldn't access all those ca uh, cash sites anymore, right? Like some of them had been built over and <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like the ones we did were in the Grunewald Forest. But they're, like I said, they were all over the city. So a lot of them probably sitting on the gas stations right now, you know? <laughs> uh, this yeah. is, uh, I'm gonna share another picture. Uh, this was uh, shared with me by a, a gent that I, I hope I'll be able to twist his arm a little bit, maybe interview him one day on the show. Um, that, who I won't good, name. I that's won't a BGS-9, right yep. But, that's yeah. a BGS-9 unit, there's Mike Maleri there, there's Ron Broughton there. I see, uh, yeah, Mike Valeri's in the middle, Ron Broad's right next to him. The rest of BGS-9 on that side, on the left side are other BGS-9 guys. Now you can see the Mercedes right behind them. And okay. uh, I got another one here of uh, their graduation because they actually went to the course and became, yep. you know, qualified GSG-9 operators. That's so absolutely, yes. Uh, here we go. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah, they're, they're there again. Yeah, that's, that's look at those sideburns. Me. That's totally yeah, out of reg. That's totally out of regulation, there, Sergeant Major. Yeah, <laughs> Mike Maleri, right next to him, <laughs> Ron Broughton. Yeah, again, that's him. Yeah, yep. Oh yeah, yep. That's that's another BGS nine on the end down there is Kelly, Captain Kelly, way down on the end with a mustache. Oh yep. Way down on the end. I don't know this guy right offhand. I know the guy in the white jacket. I can't remember his name. Yeah. And, and that is uh, Colonel Wagner, the yep. commander of GSG oh, the, nine, right there on, on the uh, on the right hand side or on the left hand side, wearing a military uniform. Right, that was in Bonn, Bonn, Germany. Just um, amazing stuff. Look, we have uh, at least one question. Let me see what we got have going on here, real quick. Let me. Uh, it's been about an hour, and I want to get to these. Um, Alex Bennett, thank you very much. Uh, did Det A and SF take any pages out of the book from the French resistance? And how uh, how would a modern Det A be organized, implemented in a place like Hong Kong? Good question. 
That's a pretty hard question. Yeah, uh, it, it, right now it, uh, it would be hard to form something like this in Hong Kong because I think every one of us know that Chinese oppression is very effective. It's done very effectively. They don't stand a chance and it's a certain death, certain death if that uh, ever happened. Uh, as far as the French resistance, uh, no, we, I don't think so. Where, where were most of your con ops and ideas coming from? I mean, were they from people with experience or were you guys just sort of creating things on the fly? We did things as needed at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was created by each individual. Every one of us had our own safe houses. We had uh, our own plans. It was very individualist. I mean, you were, you were on your own in Detachment A. There was nobody governing you, nobody ordering you, uh, telling you what to do. It was not a conventional army. It was very unconventional. Like I said, we did not exist. We were not there, period. Yeah. We had to completely operate on our own. With the ideas that you mentioned like the coal for the trains and i'm sure that there were uh, so many different ways of sabotage and, and whatnot that that you had and planned where were those ideas coming from i mean were you getting a lot of them from the agency the former oss guys um were you just kind of creating them i think it was from the former oss people and also adapted by the cia uh, we had several uh, like the coal we had shavings metal shavings that would for turbine turbine uh, power plant stuff that we'd put in the once we got into a target would pour you know get them all in the machinery and stuff like this and the silencers on our weapons were to assassinate like a we knew where the manager's office were and stuff like this and we just limited immediately as we came into the factory and mm -hmm. conduct sabotage as needed mm -hmm. Bob, uh, this is uh, just a little bit of my own two cents here on, on the question about Hong Kong is uh, this is a study that the CIA did, the way we do things, black entry operations in North Vietnam. Uh, what they found, and if you read through the study, is that what we tried to do, we tried to do and the French tried to do, uh, was recreate what worked for us in World War II with the Jedburgh teams and the OSS deploying behind Nazi lines into occupied France. We tried to recreate that and do that in Vietnam in the Indochina war. And those teams got wiped out. Like it, just, it, it just didn't work. Um, yes. And I think that's one of the real struggles we would have operating in a place like Hong Kong is that we're predominantly Caucasian, African-American, small amount of Asians in the military. Um, and, and those who are Asian ethnically, I mean, if you didn't live there you, or you didn't grow up there, you didn't grow up there, people are gonna pick you out just like they'd pick me up if I tried to go and infiltrate the IRA. So it, it's very, very difficult to operate in some of those foreign cultures. Definitely, definitely because you know, it's, so, it's so concentrated and they, you and everybody else knows the way the communists operate. They have, uh, you call them, I call them spies. They have uh, people that will turn you in in a heartbeat Mm -hmm. for a couple of dollars or, a, or a, a favor and stuff like this. And these people in Hong Kong, it's over. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's uh, over. I'm glad the Brits have offered them a lot of these people, a little sanctuary, stuff like this. I feel sorry. But that's yeah. the way the Chinese are. Everywhere. The Chinese will, they're very effective at what they do. Uh, thank you, Brad Oric. Um, did you know or work with Pat McNamara? No. Um, let me see if I, if I can, if there's any uh, thing, any funny experiences with British and French units. Uh, one time I heard the British forces were doing an exercise with the Germans. Uh, I thought the Reds were coming over the border and it turned out to be the Scots. Yeah, that was up in the east uh, up in the British sector. There was a training exercise that went kind of out, got kind of out of hand uh, between British Dead A and the German police. It was supposed to be a coordinated effort with the German police, but it got out of hand because the Brits thought we were the IRA running around. Okay, we're in civilian, of course, civilian clothes, 
German machine guns and stuff like this. And we were on a little exercise with the German police. And all of a sudden, the Brits saw us and didn't know who the hell we were. They thought we were the IRA. And a battle ensued with blanks, of course. But somebody could have got killed because yeah. the Brits did not know who we were. They haul them off to the uh, Olympic Stadium where the British had a little headquarters at the uh, Olympic Stadium there in the British sector. Arrested all the Americans, dead guys, <laughs> of course. And of course, they Pearl and Brigade got contacted and said, yeah, we had a little operation there and all this kind of stuff. And it, it kind of blew over, but it was very tense, very tense. I was arrested by the Brits. We were up in uh, the British sector in our German vehicle. Uh, it was about five of us. And we were trying to, uh, we were we were checking an access route that looked pretty pretty good to cross the border. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, there's two Brits machine gun jeeps. They blocked us, asked us who we were. We had these walk-on water cars, which didn't mean shit to them. They just said, in their polite British ways, would you please follow us? Okay, one machine gun in front, one machine gun behind, took us to the Olympic Stadium, questioned us for about five hours and finally somebody from Berlin Brigade said, yeah, they're legitimate. <laughs> I mean, they Bob, didn't mess around, old Brits. Bob, maybe you can fact check this. Uh, something I had been told once was that the special forces challenge coin originated because of the Lodge Act guys in Berlin, that they kept getting beat up by MPs because they didn't believe that they were Green Berets. They didn't believe they were in the US military. No, that's not true. The, uh, the Berlin Brigade, our coin was designed by Julius Farago, another DP, displaced person we call him. And he designed this coin. And as a matter of fact, there's, there's one thing missing on this. It's, it's, it's on there, but it's misspelled. I think oppressal is uh, misspelled. That was by yeah. Julius Farago. Yeah, he, <laughs> that's a famous, everybody goes, you know, the original was not. <laughs> okay, we got a little error on that. <laughs> that was designed in 1971, I believe. You had a silver one and a, uh, not a gold. It wasn't real gold, but it was gold. You had two. You had a silver and a gold detachment egg coin. That's but that was, cool. yeah, that's not true. Yeah, that was old. Um, no, no, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, go, go ahead, Dave. I got something else I want to I lay on you that I think you'll appreciate, Bob, but go ahead. Okay, Ian Hutchinson, uh, thank you very much. He's asking... What is your best Larry Thorne story? Larry Thorne, like I said, was a, a real, he fought the Russians, got the Finnish Medal of Honor, came to uh, Special Forces and uh, disappeared, of course, during, I think, the Vietnam War. And he was quite a guy. He had quite a background. He was very well respected in Special Forces community. He was real. He, the guy was an original, and he belonged in Special Forces. Let me tell you, he was he was something. Now he Very, he, he fought for the Finnish against the Russians. Yes. Then then the Germans. Yep. Then he, the Germans. Then he went to Germany yes. to fight the Russians, yep. and then he came to America to fight the Russians. There you go. Quite a guy. He's quite a guy. Well known, well respected. Do you have any personal stories of him? No, Did, I do not. Just, no. Okay. No. All right, Bob. You recognize this handsome gentleman? Yeah, I do, but I can't. I can't think of his name. It's Rick. Who? Rick Lavoie. Oh, okay. Yes, Rick Lavoie. Yeah, he's down in Florida now. We stay in touch quite a bit. Uh, like I said, he was on that Hatcher team mission with me, and uh, we stay in touch in touch quite a bit because for him that was a special time too because we could have got wiped out that night, that day. Mm -hmm. I mean. It was it was very intense. There's another one. This is uh, yeah, this is uh, in Korea. Yep, yep. yep. I can buy his sunglasses. Yes, <laughs> he, was, he was quite a guy. He was well respected. He uh, went on to 10th Special Forces Group at Devon's, Command Sergeant Major. He was run out of uh, Sigrun and uh, really, yeah, because uh, we were involved in a very big battle up by Noi Baden Song Bay area, and uh, he was shot out of. Three landing zones shot out his recon team. And he came back, they were refueling. I mean, we had big bladders of fuel on a landing zone, PSP on the ground. It was hot, it was cold, it was smelling. I mean, it was, it was and, and Rick was, he was worn out. 
and he was sitting there at the chopper with his car 15 on his lap and his Colonel Drake wanted them to reinsert again. He said, not today, sir. And that night, Sergeant Major Brunkart got him out, sent him to another camp, got him out of Honar Town Sigma, saved nice. his ass because Drake would have court-martialed his ass. Oh, man. <laughs> And this is uh, this is another uh, picture that uh, Rick. This is getting a little bit off topic, but I think this is a little interesting to people. Now, I, I, I you probably know this, Bob, but another one of these things that people just don't know about probably don't know that U.S. Special Forces accompanied South Korean Special Forces hunting down and killing North Korean communist terrorists who infiltrated across the DMZ and were conducting essentially death squad operations against the civilian population. This is like back in the 60s. Most Americans just don't know anything about this stuff. And these are a couple of North Korean infiltrators that yeah, they wiped out. I didn't know anything about debt case missions, but uh, that makes sense to me. I mean, that they were over there just like we were in today. Debt case had their missions, we had ours. Yep. You'll, you'll have to, you, you can ask, uh, you know, Rick lived it. So he knows far more about this than, than I do. I just know what he was, uh, what he was able to share with me. Um, but man, this is, this is amazing, Bob. So your second tour over there, um, were there any counterterrorism operations that you guys got spun up for that you, that you were like on call for that you had to go and execute? No, not really. There was no counterterrorist uh, actual, except for the but that wasn't, it was, we did counter surveillance only on the bottom of Meinhof gang. Uh, that was what the Germans uh, police asked us to do. And it was their mission, not ours. Okay, we were there to, we did counter surveillance on them. And their mission was to capture and uh, whatever they wanted to do with them. Okay, but no, we did not. Maybe you weren't there when it happened, but I, I've been told that uh, Dead A was at least on standby or had some part. And when uh, I think it was General Dozier or Crozier was uh, kidnapped in Italy. The East, yeah, the Berlin, uh, the Red Brigade. Yes. Okay. I don't know if Dead A, I was not there at that time. I don't think they were involved in that. Yeah, I, I, I think they were just on standby for it. Oh, yeah. That probably would make sense because we, the anti terrorist group, uh, that was our mission at that time. We were probably on standby. I, I don't doubt that a bit. And so after uh, after your time in the debt, wh where did uh, where did you go afterwards? After you did, you got another five years at Dead A. I was, went back to Fort Devens, where I retired out of, and uh, mm -hmm. and I got a job with Vidal Corporation in Saudi Arabia. Got back from there, and then I went with the uh, FEMA Mobile Emergency Response Support. Uh, we trained at Mount Weather in Berryville, Virginia. It was a continuity of government mission, 24-7 uh, operations center. Very interesting work, uh, good bunch of people. And I retired out of that in the 90s. Now, while you were gone, Debt A did spin up for a real live counterterrorism operation. You know, um, you think we could talk about that a little bit? That's an interesting uh, interlude uh, as far as Dead A's role in that. The what? Uh, when when they got spun up for uh, Operation Eagle Claw for the Iran. Oh mission. right, okay, yes, yeah, that was uh, uh, I was not there at the time. I had left in 1978, and it, it was right after that. That's when we were at a peak at our and I, Of course, I was read right into the op plan and the after action report on it. And uh, uh, the, I don't know any, I was not involved in it though. Mm -hmm. You asked about the individual thing now. And again, we go back to this. Mm -hmm. Our guys got on civilian aircraft, went in the country, conducted their own reconnaissance missions. They had no support from anybody else except themselves, their passport and their brains. They went down there, did recon, conducted the recon, gave feedback about the situation at hand, and when everything climaxed and stuff like this, they were on their own to get out of that country by themselves. And now nobody knew they were the situation, except when they got back to Munich, Germany, or wherever, and said, Sergeant Major Riker, we're here at Munich, Germany. We get out. That's how it happened. 
That's amazing. I mean, I don't know if they were planning on exhaling with the assault force uh, or not, but I, I'm, I wonder how they realize that, oh shit, like this isn't happening. Cause it's not like it's on the news, you know, that, that what's going on at, at desert one. So there, you have to imagine that they might be sitting there twiddling their thumbs or wondering like, you know, watching their, their, their watches going, Hmm, you know, we should have heard something by now. Yeah. Um, and then at what point they decided to go ahead and exfil the country? Well, that's where the CIA came in. Okay. Once the final plan and they, they, they would have executed it for these three uh, guys that were at the uh, foreign mission there, then the CIA would have took over. They would have controlled the situation from then on. I see. Okay. But they, and at that time you had to, you, you could not expose anybody outside your sources because you didn't want to get people involved that should not be involved. Right. So it was strictly a dead A individual situation like we were famous for. Okay. You did things on your own, you had your own plan and you knew how to execute that plan. And just to add a little bit of background, um, if you guys remember, or if you go back and watch the episode we did with Sergeant Major Mike Vining, who was one of the Delta operators on the ground for Eagle Claw. Um, it was a, the embassy was being held. There were all these American hostages there at the American embassy. Uh, Colonel Beckwith realized at a certain point, had his hand forced by some accounts, he didn't have enough operators to cover the entire embassy grounds and also the chancellery building, the, the MFA building, yep. where there was an additional, I think it was like, what, seven or eight American hostages being held there, Bob? Three. 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 And so he didn't have enough operators to cover both this huge embassy grounds right. and the MFA building. And so Dead A was brought in to, or two guys undercover as business, German businessmen to gather reconnaissance for Eagle Claw. And then there, uh, on the assault force, they integrated a small element from Dead A, since they had a counterterrorism capability. They were to go in with the Delta guys, and they were the ones that would have done the assault on the MFA building and released right. those hostages. Right. That's correct. Yep. And, and then, then the, when they were there, like I told you earlier, they realized they didn't have enough forces at the time to do what they were supposed to do. So re they requested more Delta Force people to help assist in the uh, taking of these uh, people. And, and the uh, one of the Dead A guys that went in there that you were describing, he actually got pictures of the MFA building, like that's right Scotty in front McEwen. of it. Scotty McEwen, that's him. With, with a with a guard, right? Yeah, with a guard. The guard took the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That's that's, that's using your head. <laughs> that's uh, that's some big brass balls on uh, on that jet. You got it. You got it right there. And, yeah. Hey, hey Bob. Uh, here's a question um, from Nick. I'm just kind of trying to see if I can pick some out. How did Dead A's planning for unconventional warfare and stay behind operations synchronize with other uh, UW uh, unconventional efforts planned by the US inside Germany, such as 10th mm -hmm. S Special Forces Group, Green Light Teams, Fifth Corps LERPs, things like that? We had done nothing to do with them. We were on our own. We had nothing to do, we were not OPCON to 10 Special Forces at all. We assisted them in training, like I told you earlier. But our missions were on, only our own. We had nothing to do with anybody else. Were you aware of their missions? I mean, was there any type of deconfliction or anything like that? No, the overall, I guess, picture was if the balloon did go up, we had missions that we would conduct all over Europe. Not only if we survived Berlin, okay, we would or medically, I mean, not medically, physically, E and E, if, if we could. But it was like I said, it was a suicide mission, and uh, we had NATO exercises that we participated in with the ten special forces, like Flintlock and stuff like this. NATO missions that we would go with them on. They had a down pilot missions that we would conduct, and we would ask the ten special forces in battles for help. They would ask us for help, for, like during Flintlock exercises. We worked closely together. There was probably a plan at some level that both units could 
conduct during a actual situation, but I was not aware of that. When, when you would run into the, like, I'm sure that some of your guys knew other guys from 10th Special Warfare, uh, you know, or from, you know, from 10th Group or whatever, uh, and, and maybe just being around the conventional army. How did you guys kind of shrug off the whole, hey, who are you guys? Or, hey, Bob, what's going on? What, what are you doing here? I didn't know you were in Germany. You know, that kind of thing. It was a question that you never was never asked, really, because Tenth Group of all the Special Forces units, Tenth Group was the only other people in Special Forces that had an idea that we were in Berlin. Okay. So they didn't ask questions. Most of the other folks in the SF communities didn't know. They had a they had an idea. They heard there was a unit in Berlin, but it was so well classified that nobody asked any questions. And Never. what about, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. Well, what about the conventional, I don't know if you had to deal with the conventional army at any point or whatever, but if they would see your reduced grooming or your relaxed grooming standards, you know, you said that sometimes you would go on these, uh, the runs into the authorized runs. How did they deal with you uh, seeing that, you know, you had these huge mutton chops and things like that? It was questionable. Matter of fact, uh, if you tried to go in the bur in Berlin, the the PX post exchange and stuff like that. They always had a guy up there that checking ID cards. And when you showed up, they'd take a look at you and go, who the hell are you? <laughs> but you had an ID card and they just, okay, you're, you're in. Uh, as, as conventional forces, yes, we had problems. We had a lot of problems with the conventional office corps, especially who the hell are you? You know, and there was some confrontation sometimes and they'd want to know what's your rank. Okay, stuff like this. Well, it's classified. Sorry, I can't tell you. And uh, I was involved in an episode of uh, the East Sea, Rosenbrot of Germany. And I was conducting scout swimmer ex exercises for the Berlin Brigade Infantry. And so I was up there taking pictures of targets, selected targets for them. We could assign to those guys so they could hit them. And it was a radar station, okay? I'm out there, and there's this German walking by, and he's looking at me like, who the hell is this guy? Okay, he takes down my license plate and stuff like this. Nothing happened. I got back to Berlin, and the CID, Criminal Investigation Department, called my team leader over and says, we got a report of one of your guys that was taking pictures of a radar station. What's, what's all this? Okay, and so it was, you know, run by the proper sources and cleared up and stuff like this, but that's something that happens. Yeah. You know, you were, you were definitely a spy. You look like a spy, yeah. you know, I mean, God damn, I mean, so many clothes, long hair and stuff like this. And nobody, you know, nobody around, you're taking pictures of a compound. You draw a lot of attention. And we did, I mean, it was, yeah, we did. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of conflict with the conventional army, conventional forces. Uh, who the hell are you guys and stuff like this. That was a big question that always came up. Um, another question has come up a couple times, Bob. Did you guys work with portable nukes? Uh, oh, backpacks? Satum devices you're talking about? Satum devices? Yeah. No, yeah. Dead A did not have. Bad Tolls had them. We did not have. No. But Bad, bad Tolls had Satum. Yep. Bob, maybe we can, uh, if you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, because this unit, Detachment A, it, it no longer exists today. It's right. uh, it's an inactivated unit and your, your colors have been encased and everything else. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about the winding down of Detachment A and, and how and why that came about? The, uh, uh, the exercise in Iraq, Iraq opened up a lot of questions to the conventional forces in Europe and abroad about who this unit was, Detachment A. Nobody knew who it was over the years and stuff like this. And all of a sudden, Newsweek ran an article shortly after the uh, hostage situation down there in which uh, Detachment A was involved. And they took a look and said, well, who the, again, everybody always said, who the hell are these guys? So they took a microscope, went over us, and they said, well, we have a, our own Delta Force. We don't need another one. Uh, the Russians probably know all about the attachment in Berlin, which they did not know. They, uh, upon later examination with uh, General Schachnow in Berlin, 
he was like, you know, he had to do, he had to rub shoulders with the, uh, all the full power officers and stuff like this. And he talked to the, one of the Russian generals and the Russian general casually said, oh, special forces. Uh, yeah, he said, you had about 900, 800 people in Berlin. Well, we didn't, we had 90 at the back, maximum. So force multiplies, okay, uh, stuff like this. So the powers to be decided to shut down detachment A. And it was stupid because all of a sudden then they brought in PSSE, physical security support element, which was again, special forces playing military police role, operating as detachment A did, only they were at Roosevelt barracks, not Andrews barracks. So they had a cover story that they were military police, but they was again in uniform, uh, the staff was in uniform. The operators were still in civilian clothes and long hair. So it was just like a repeat. And they never quite got the uh, attention or the acclaim that A did. Uh, they lasted, I think, four years, just around the time the Berlin Wall went down, they were gone. PSSC was gone. And uh, that's when I jumped in uh, after all my time and retired and stuff like this and going down to Devons and see my ex detachment A folks, I uh, decided to take a chance and find out what the uh, classification was. I was going to write a book that was in the early 90s, but I was told, no, you can't. Okay, I left that alone. And then in the uh, right around 2000, six or seven, that's when I contacted uh, Sid Shack now and asked him, can I write this thumbnail report about Detachment A because we're losing our history, we're losing our folks, we're dying, we're dying out. And I'd like it to be recognized in SF history. That's when I started the movement to have my annual Asheville Detachment A function each year, which was you attended. And uh, we kept this, uh, this we got our recognition in the Special Forces Regiment, finally. Got a stone put in down to Fort Bragg, and uh, here we are today. Let me see. I think I have a picture of the of the stone. This is down there. Was that a big moment for you, Bob, and, oh, and for no. the other guys when you went down there and they had that ceremony? I was so well attended. It was unbelievable. Uh, General Cleveland, the three, he was a three-star. He attended our course that we had in Berlin that I told you about earlier. They were ran through from 10th group to SEALs and people like that. He attended our course in Berlin and that was a particular moment. I helped design that stone. Uh, I made a speech there about that stone. It was one of the most important moments I ever had. I tell you, I, tell you, I was uh, really proud that that stone went in the ground there. And we had a, oh, we were well attended. <laughs> a lot of a lot of detachment a folks that came from all over yeah and and i mean that's one of the things that maybe people don't realize is especially today in the information age even with really uh secret units like there's a whiff of them you, you know you can go on the internet maybe what you find isn't accurate but you can still find mention you can still find things but it, but prior to you know, the information age prior to the computers and things like that, like things like Det A were legitimately secret. Like nobody really had any idea. Um, nope. Maybe a few hushed whispers here and there from, guy, from guys who might know something yep. on the periphery. How, I mean, this is a question for both of you, actually. So Jack, you went to Asheville to talk to these guys. And what was that like for you? And, and Bob, what was it like when Jack came down there and for the first time wanted to sort of talk about this thing? And how, how did you receive it? How did the guys receive it? Um, what was that like for both of you? Bob, if you want to start. For me, it, it was uh, when Jack agreed to come and interview. And I put the word out. Like I put out a monthly sit rep and did that's for eight folks on uh Oh, this guy, that guy, stuff like this. When I put the word out that Jack was going to come down and do an interview for an article, these people couldn't wait. It was like coming out of a clamshell. Finally, we could talk about what the hell we did. Yeah. We did so many missions and we got attaboys, but that was all. Right. You did the mission, next one come along, you did it, 
did it, did it from 1956 to 1984, and you got no recognition. So when I talked to Jack and he went down there, these people came out of the woodwork and wanted to talk to Jack because they wanted their story told. It was very important to all of us. And Jack, what yeah, I, I mean, for me, it was a, a huge honor, you know, to, to be invited down there and to meet all of these people. And, you know, you guys are, you know, my heroes. Uh, you know, I grew up, you know, idolizing all of you guys. And I, I didn't even know about Dead A so much until way, way later. But I knew about your service, you know, what, what Special Forces did in Vietnam. And, you know, I really grew up admiring you guys and wanting to be just like you, which is what led me into the military myself. Um, so to be able to come down there and meet these these guys, these guys were a lot of them are legends. You know, it was a huge honor for me and a huge privilege, and to especially at a reunion and be able to just sit there like one after one, at one after the other, interviewing all of these guys and hearing their stories. I mean, oh my God! I talked to Colonel Wild was there when the wall went up, not when the wall went down, when it went up. <laughs> he was there for that. Uh, so was. Um, Oh, geez, I can't remember the other guy's name. He started off as a radio operator and then became special forces and got read onto the mission later. Um, people were there really early on where there's still Nazi bullet holes in all the buildings and everything. Uh, and just doing incredible operations um, and meeting incredible people. Like I mentioned Doc Farr, who is um, one of the, uh, you know, the, the, the staples of special operations medicine. He's a huge deal. Um, Ron Broughton, uh, martial artist. He's a, you know, some people call him uh, the Chuck Norris of special forces. <laughs> huge martial artist. Um, and, and just super, super interesting people. And to put them on camera and have them tell their story, it was just so interesting that th th a lot of them were like, I feel so strange talking about this. Like I, I haven't been able to say a word about this for 50 years. And now here I am in front of a camera just like telling you you know, 90, 90% 90 of it. Um, and there were a few guys, one or two, who uh, they got in front of the camera and they gave nothing but the cover story of the unit. But, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I can't talk about that. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, I can't. Right. We conducted training in Germany. We were there prepared for operations if needed. Uh, I can't talk about anything else. That's okay. I, I respect that, but some <laughs> some guys that they want to take it to the grave with them, and you know. Yep. But yep. that's the secret. That's the secrecy of the unit. It's a secret unit, uh, clandestine mission, and uh, people take it seriously. And, and and I think there is, you know, I think there's this misconception. I don't know misconception. You know, obviously there's the idea of the silent professional that we don't talk. You know, the people in special operations community don't really talk about what they do. But I think it's more they don't brag about what they do, as opposed to if you are a part of history, you yeah. sort of want people to know that history. You know, it's not so much about you getting the credit. Yeah, it's yeah. about uh, it's just about people knowing that the, that this it, it, it's it, it's really what it's about. First and foremost, is today's generation of Green Berets knowing about what Bob and his teammates did. That's first and foremost what what needs to be understood. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. One hundred percent. I mean, there were no bragging rights about this unit. I mean, it was all real, and like I said, it was covered up for so long, and some of them wouldn't talk to Jack because they felt it was still the same. Yeah. And that's what I exposed. I exposed. It's not classified no more. We could come out and speak about it, and like I said, today we're in the Special Forces Regiment. We got the stone in the ground. And we're in our special forces history. And that's very important. It was very important to all of us to finally get the recognition due for sure. what we did. And I tell you, it was, it was one unit that, uh, that I can't say enough about it because it was all true, well done. If you weren't worth a shit, you didn't stay there long. I, we had a couple guys that were running refugees for money. They were gone overnight. Uh, you just, you had to be top notch all the time. Yeah. Now, out of, out of curiosity, let's talk about those guys running refugees because for people who don't really understand what Berlin and Germany was like at that time, when, when the split happened and, and Russia took sort of that East Berlin sector, people weren't overly happy. And like 
over a million, maybe three million. I can't remember the exact number, but but people left East Germany, right? Yes. And, and and so the wall, even though uh, in what was it called, the anti-fascist defense rampart. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, because you know the communists love using anti-fascist as as a term for for righteousness. But anyway. Um, they, you know, they, they put that, they put the, the uh, wall up uh, sort of with the excuse of we're protecting ourselves from the West, but really the wall was to stop people from escaping. That's exactly right. Right. And so the, the numbers of refugees from East Berlin or East Germany went down from like a million or plus to like a hundred. Right. With yes. a lot of people getting killed trying to, to yeah, get yeah. out. So right. when, when those guys started running refugees, were they using government resources to do that? Were they using their own wits to do that? They were they were using their own POV, their own wits. Uh, it was a for money only job. They made a lot of money doing it. And uh, one of them was our S1, Clyde Goodbread. <laughs> Personnel, of course. Yeah, he was a, 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 a S1 clerk in Detachment A. And uh, next thing I know, he was gone overnight. I, I mean, did they, if, if they weren't using government resources to do it, did they just stay in Germany and keep doing it since they had it down? No, they were reassigned. I don't know where. I did see that one guy in a couple years <laughs> later. And uh, he was a, uh, he, was assigned to some unit in southern Germany somewhere, and I got to say hi, and that was it. Um, a couple more questions came in us here. Um, were there any POC or we'll say non Caucasian members of Debt A? And if there were any, how were they incorporated given that uh, the areas you operated were predominantly white? That's a good question. In the early stages, no, we did not have any. Uh, it was strictly white in the early days because in Germany, there were not too many blacks running around. Later in the seventies, uh, we had a rigor section for our parachutes. Uh, and the first glad we put out, you know, we put out a request for a rigor because we we're gonna have our own rigor shed to pack our own chutes when we made our monthly jumps into Southern Germany. And the first guy that showed up a, a rigor was a black dude. Okay, and it was fine. By that time, Germany was very integrated in the 70s. I mean, it was it was not no more an issue of black and white. It was, and that's how it did task, but they, uh, they would assimilate all the time with the changes, any changes going on, be it hair, uniforms, coat and tie, blue jeans, anything we had to assimilate to the locals mm -hmm. and he showed up and bingo i think one other one showed up later and that was i mean that was the way it was I but it was a mission it was mission oriented okay in the early days it was such and late, later it was such so we just assimilated as we had to yeah it, it would sort of be like us the three of us trying to go to hong kong and operate uh it, it just wouldn't happen that's team six you're looking at right there on that picture. I'm no, God damn, that's, that's quite a picture, boy. <laughs> <laughs> those oh, mustaches no, and no, sideburns, turtlenecks. Guys. Yeah. The middle guy is Super Jew. He's a team son, Herpers. And there's Ron Broughton sitting down there at the table. Juan oh, Rinta. geez. I didn't even recognize him. Oh, yeah. He was a skinny dude in them days. That Juan Rinta back there, he was a Cuban. And... Uh, Robbie Robinson, he was in Thailand with me and later came. This guy was on the Sante raid uh, oh. in North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. was Gil Turcotte, he just passed away. John, uh, John Liner, he's out in Utah right now. He had a, this guy with the glasses, hell of a scuba diver instructor. He was well, well, well run. Quite a, that's team six, that's a famous picture. Unreal. That's a great picture though. Yep. That's dead A, and I'd say that was about 1972. Got the ashtray on the table, so it's before uh, all the smoking bands. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, 
and then there's uh let's see here sorry i uh, lost it um i think there's one more question yeah thanks alex um greetings fellow granite state uh stater from the upper valley what was your favorite meal in your travels uh and what is your favorite thing about new hampshire i was born and raised in new hampshire it's a beautiful state uh just later on in life i got four bullet holes in me the cold weather kind of got to me taxes were getting kind of high <laughs> <laughs> and I remember down here in the South was nice. And we used to train down here and all these exercises. I asked my wife, Linda, I said, Linda, would you like to go to down to Carolinas? And of course, Linda being Linda, she said, sure. So we uh, got out of New Hampshire in 2003, been down here ever since. And we love it down here also. But New Hampshire is beautiful. My favorite meal in Germany was of course, all Americans, they like the Wiener Schnitzel. Everybody loves Wiener Schnitzel, okay? It's uh, pork, very good, very good meal. German Kartoffelsalat, Bayerische, Bayerische Kartoffelsalat, and Bavarian the, potato salad. When you were in Vietnam and living with the Mott Yards, what did you think of the food there? And, and was there anything in particular that you really liked when you were with the yards? None. <laughs> oh, what, I mean... We had water buffalo steaks that were hard as hell. <laughs> and we, we used to take a one, once a month, we'd get out, a, a couple of guys would get down to Saigon to the commissary and come back with these big, long OD cans of spam. <laughs> I mean, stuff like this. And we had, uh, Cookie used to cook up something. I don't know what it was. I think it was monkey for hamburger. Okay, stuff like this. Uh, did, we ate did a lot of ever... rice. Did, did you get initiated into the tribe, Bob? Like the, like, yes, I uh, did. Oh, yes, did? I did. What was oh, that like? Oh, that was something else. Let me tell you what. That was an experience and a half. I mean, they, they slaughter. It's not slaughtering. It's a custom. They will cut a water buffalo as a sacrifice to you. They cut it, cut it all up. You're watching them as they do this. I mean, from live to dead to ground. Then you have this nunpai, they call it. It's a big, tall jug with all kinds of shit in the middle, man. You see there's bugs, there's green stuff in there with a big bamboo straw. And you got to drink this shit. And man, you're gagging. And that, there's a water buffalo in front of you with all kinds of flies on it, half cooked and stuff like this. And you got to eat it. And then you get your little silver bracelet, little silver thing you put around your the hand. Friendship bracelet, yeah. Yep. And uh, you were you were initiated into the tribe, and it was a real thing. I mean, this was not a, a show. You were really this this bracelet was to protect you against the Viet Cong, also. Yeah. Uh, you know, as for them, it was really special. And boy, but what an ordeal it was! Well, I'll tell you, it was something else. And do you still have your bracelet? Yes, I do. I still have my bracelets. The Jirai tribe. Yes, I do. Yeah. Bob, you're the real deal, man. <laughs> you are yeah you, you you're the, the real mccoy you got that you did a, the special forces mission through and through yeah and i look around today at the, at the uh a lot of changes the old 18s not so close as they used to be and they're not used like they used to be it's changed as every situation in wartime and uh military everything changes but uh there's a lot of concern now the we still have the troops that want to be special forces, they they cherish the old special forces, mm -hmm. Green Beret time frame and stuff like this. But now they're in there, they're getting misused and uh, overextended. Divorce rates out of sight and stuff like this, and the morale is not that good. But the troops are a hundred percent dedicated as always. Uh, they go in looking for the best. And once I get in there, it's not the same no more. Yep, yep. That that was that pretty much sums up my experience as well, Bob. Uh, do you think? Uh, what do you think has gone wrong? Do you think that it's uh, that we've deviated too far away from the unconventional warfare mission? Do you think special forces has gotten too big? No, Jack. The uh, special forces mission has increase not decrease unconventional warfare is the biggest thing going right now you see them pulling out of afghanistan who's left behind who's left behind with the training who's out there in the field special forces troops now the military conventional forces use special forces badly i mean they're out there they don't have no support it's uh 
like I don't. Do you remember Stoffel and Anderson who were charged with murder a few years when, back? A couple and, of years uh, back? Yeah, a few years back. I'd say it was about probably ten years or ten years back. There, yeah, Jack Stoffel yep. was the master sergeant. Stoffel and Anderson, they shot a double agent and they were charged with murder. Okay. Wait, what, 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 what was this, Bob? Oh, Christ, I can't remember. That was back in 2008, probably 2009. Uh, for, so, for some reason, this is totally slipping my mind. But go, go ahead. But anyway, they were charged with uh, murder and stuff like this. So uh, we went down to SOCOM, a couple of us guys, and uh, tried to get some facts and stuff like this. And Sid Shack now was in on this also as a two-star and uh, there was quite a bit of controversy about why they were being charged with murder because it was a bona fide kill and uh, highly publicized. And then all of a sudden the tide turned and uh, Shaq now and his Jewish friends put up the money for the, uh, the lawyers and the legal fees and stuff like this. And we're down there getting a briefing by Admiral Olson. Yeah, he was his mm -hmm. chief at that time. And Sid Shack now was there. He's retired, but he was sitting there, and there was a bunch of bunch of us all together down there at SOCOM in the uh, auditorium. And we, you know, they were taking questions and stuff like this. So we brought up Stefan Anderson. I, I jumped up and I said, you know, I says uh, if I was Stefan Anderson, I said I would not have gone out of my compound. I said, you know. If they're going to be charged with murder, how the hell can they effectively go out there and train Afghans or whatever? And you guys are going to, if they kill a double agent or something like this, you're going to charge them with murder? So anyway, Anderson retired. He had enough time to retire the master sergeant. And the other guy was a captain. And he, we conducted a debriefing up in, uh, uh, in North Carolina. We had veterans of special forces on a bunch of us, BSF. Veterans Special Shack now, a couple other generals, General Guest, me, Michael Lenane. So we got a debriefing from the captain. He told us all what happened, stuff like this. And we were down, went down to Fort Bragg and all that and attended that meeting. And it's, uh, we really jumped on the officers down there, the uh, old Admiral Olson, stuff like this. So after the meeting was over, this three star comes up to me and he says, he's real casually, he says, don't want to make this public right now, but they've been cleared. They're, they're, they're not going to be charged with us. I said, oh, that's great, you know, stuff like this. Then it went public. They were cleared, stuff like this. And I'm going, that's how you use the special forces today. They can't go out there and do their job. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, they, and they were out there all alone. Here's what they they told us at the they get when he gave me, us the debriefing. He said they to get an ammunition. At their camp, where they were, it would take something like three months after they got a request for ammo to get to their camp. However, when this incident happened, the CID and lawyers were on a helicopter and were there within 24 hours. Right. Amazing how that works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, uh, well, yeah. anyway. I was talking to uh, an SF guy like in 2008 out in Afghanistan. Uh, 2008 2009 and he, he i mean he told me that basically anytime they got in a firefight a tick anytime they fired a weapon they had to fill out an incident report and it's like holy cow yeah i mean that was a, what would they what did they call that courageous restraint i think they called it that was that was later on when uh mccrystal uh was yeah. in charge of afghanistan yeah yeah but uh anyways it's a quite a task today uh i i feel sorry for the young troopers that are coming in i you look at them, and they're the best of what we mm -hmm. you, know, you see. They, you, you look at them; they're educated, they're well trained, uh, and then they get out there, and it's just like when Vietnam ended. They tried to disband the groups and stuff like this. They assigned all the NCOs to uh, reenlistment sections, ROTC. They busted up the groups. Uh, conventional army has never, never liked. Special Forces, and that has not changed. Yeah, yeah. I, I really think we we owe these young men, and as of Thursday, actually, uh, one young woman, uh, we owe all of them 
better than what we've been given them, you know, uh, the last 20 years or whatever, whatever it is now. And um, it's an institutional problem. You know, it is. it's not, it's it not going to go away easily. Oh, no, it's not. Well, Bob, this has been absolutely amazing. Do, um, do we have any one more question left there? Yeah, one uh, more question here. Um, thank you, uh, General Krang. Uh, during the Cold War stuff uh, behind the curtain, so when you guys would take those trips over, did you pack a handgun? And if more, like nine mil submachine gun, et cetera, like when you would do those approved, would you would you carry? We carry it all the time, twenty four seven. Individual choice, individual weapons. You had you don't you can. You had your own weapon. The official weapon was P-38 pistol, but we carried civilian clothes. We carried our own weapon. How, how, how did you come by that weaponry? You bought it locally. Okay, if you had a uh, rod and gun clubs over there, you could buy a gun. Ammunition was never a problem. Uh, when we met with the German secret police in our day room downstairs, they'd come in there, they were loaded to the hill. With weapons and stuff like this. And so were we, and we drank and drank and drank and had a good time. And then uh, next day, you went about your business as usual. But it was camaraderie with the German secret police. They were very good, they were very effective. And it was part of our mission, okay? We had to operate with them. They were in control of the city, not us. Bob, I'm going to ask you uh, to stay with us for like another 15 minutes to, to do the bonus segment, talk about Libya, if, uh, if your wife's not going to kill me. Um, uh, okay. so yeah, please thank her for me. Um, this has been really an amazing episode and it's really been a, an honor to have this conversation with you. And, uh, I, I'm, I actually learned a lot about you as we did this too, because you and I, as much as we had talked about dead a, we had never talked about Vietnam really before. Um, no. so I'm hearing all this for the first time and it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so everyone who joined us live, we had like 120 people watching us live tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming and joining uh, Bob and Dave and I tonight. It's really great. Um, please like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, leave some comments below, tell us what you like, what you dislike. Um, and also there's gonna be a link down in the description for this video for our Patreon site if you want to uh, help support the stream, keep us going. And if you'd like to have access to the bonus segments like the one we're about to do with Bob. Uh, next week, let me just tease out the episode for next week real quick. Uh, where are we here? Ah, next week, Neil Hansen, he was an Air America pilot. And uh, he was flying around the Laos. And he, this was Air America was the CIA's secret air force. I'm sure you know all about that, Bob. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, he was, uh, he, he, yeah was early in, he was early in the program. Um, so he, he has a, a vast knowledge of of how the program grew and where it went. He flew in Vietnam, he flew in Laos. Um, very interesting. Bob, uh, could you let the audience know, because you run a unofficial website for Detachment A where people can go and get lots more information, see a lot of pictures about the debt. Um, what is that website? What can they find there? I don't have that right now in front of me, but uh, I can get that for it's, you. It's all right. I'll, I'm, all, I'm all over it, Bob. Uh, okay. It is detachment slash a dot org. There you go. You and if you go and check that out, um, and you'll actually, you'll find a, an, an article that I wrote about detachment a that I'm partial to. Um, but there's also a lot of other information on the site and lots of great pictures of the detachment. Um, and this is like the unofficial site of the debt that, uh, that Bob runs and it kind of gets all of the veterans of the unit together. And Bob does a lot of work to bring all the guys back together. Um, I think I saw in there, the reunion this year is canceled. Um, yeah, because of coronavirus. Yes. Are you, you plan to keep it going though next year? I don't know, Jack, at this time, I've, uh, I think I'm going to uh, retire. Yeah. Hey, let, yeah one, it, let one of the other guys take the reins. Well, you know, it's uh, it's kind of dwindling now. The, the interest is kind of personal problems, a lot of deaths. People mm -hmm. don't want to travel no more. Yeah, uh, it's kind it's kind of winding down. I mean, they they all stay in touch. I mean, I get calls all the time from folks and stuff, but I can tell the interest is uh, it's gone. I mean, two two years ago when they had the hurricane up there in Asheville, we had over 140 people signed up to come. And that was one of the biggest ones. And the last one I had was last September. And it was well, about 100. Uh, 
pretty well attended PSSE. I invited PSSE to come. I wanted to integrate PSSE with Dead A because they're younger and they can mm -hmm. probably keep the history of Berlin Special Forces going a lot longer than I can. So yeah, maybe it's up to somebody a little bit younger now to take the reins that's, from that's, Bob. And... That's what that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> All right. Well, we will see you next week, guys, with uh, Neil Hansen talking about Air America in his book, which uh, Dave uh, Dave has read. So we're going to have some great conversation with him. And Bob, thank you one more time, and uh, we'll join you in just a sec for the bonus segment. So ask, ask this pilot if he knew Rocky Neeson. Rocky Neeson. I will. Okay. He's Air America pilot also in them days. All right, we will do. All right, okay. thank you, everybody. We'll see you next.